uh, with any further ado. It is definitely my absolute privilege and pleasure on behalf of the Editors Forum of Namibia to welcome you here tonight. We are extremely delighted to have you with us to participate and share in the EFN 2020 Journalism Awards. Thank you all for coming, and especially our keynote speaker, Professor Anton Haber, who traveled from South Africa to share with and witness the 30th anniversary of the Vinduk Declaration, together with the 2020 EFN Journalism Awards in the city where the Vinduk Declaration originates. Our presence here certainly serves as a reminder of just how important our work is. Equally, I would also like to welcome those who are following proceedings online. A special word of welcome is also extended to our sole sponsor of tonight's ceremony, FNB Namibia, who is demonstrating its commitment to the ideals of media freedom through its financial support. Ladies and gentlemen, the EFN Annual Awards, I must emphasize, is to promote excellent and professional journalism in Namibia, underpinned by a commitment to truth impartiality and objectivity. We are at the eve of the Global Conference on World Press Freedom Day, coinciding with the 30th anniversary of the Venduk Declaration, and I wish also to pay tribute to the founders of the Declaration, conceived by Africans for Africans, and which had such a global impact. In view of the strides made since the Venduk Declaration, the media fraternity suddenly looks forward to the Venduk Plus 30 Declaration. And uh, as you see the, the candles here on stage, lovely uh, decor here on the stage, uh, there are 30 candles on, on, on stage here, and each of them represents one year of the Venduk Declaration. But as for tonight, just like at the upcoming Global World Co uh, Press Freedom Day conference, prepare yourself to be challenged, excited, and be inspired. And before I hand back to the Director of Ceremonies, I want to say once more, on behalf of the Editors Forum of Namibia, thank you for joining us here. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. In demonstration of that financial commitment by First, First National Bank of Namibia, this evening we have Ms. Alzita Birkes. She is the communications manager for FNB Namibia. Please welcome her as she delivers her address. I told you she looks very pretty in that red dress. Thank you, Afra. If I wasn't nervous, I sure am now. <laughs> Um, good evening, everyone. I believe protocol was beautifully observed, so I will just say um, welcome and good evening to all our distinguished guests tonight. Um, tonight, it's my great honor to represent FNB Namibia as the main and sole sponsor of the Editors Forum of Namibia, um, as well as the sponsor of the Business and Finance and Innovation Award tonight as well. Given the continued difficult environment we find ourselves in, as a bank, we are more than ever convinced that a considered response within the context of balancing social, economic, and environmental consideration is needed. F&B, of course, cannot solve all the world's problems. However, we have many tools at our disposal to be a force of good. If we use these wisely and intentionally, um, creating both social and economic value, we believe we will remain a sustainable, growing business and continue to earn the trust of all our stakeholders. We recognize that we have responsibility to deliver chair value to multiple stakeholders and to earn public trust we must, by design, align business priorities with that of our society. Protecting freedom and of expression and media freedom, especially now in times of pandemic, is of vital importance. We are now more than ever relying on the media for news and information to help us navigate uncertainty. FNB is acutely aware that as an economy, uh, the economy cannot hope to grow without an educated and well-informed society and workforce. And as a response, we focus on systemic education initiatives and skills development through our foundation. And through our partnership with the EFN, we hope to aid in fostering reliable journalism that rests on the standards of professional ethics to keep the public informed and engaged. This year, the world looks very different than previous years. Because of the unprecedented global crisis, citizens are seeking out accurate, reliable information. 
We thank the journalists, editors, and support staff who continue to work despite challenges and great personal risk to themselves. It's times like these that we know and realize that journalism and journalists is essential workers. The role and significance of media is evident now more than ever. Journalists across the world have stepped up, the challenge, stepped up to the challenge of ensuring the public is provided with information that could save their lives. Protecting journalism and the work they do protects us all. This year, World Press Freedom Day has come home, and we are proud to have sponsored an additional 50,000 towards the anniversary celebrations happening this week. Ladies and gentlemen, information is key and influences policy change in many positive ways. The free flow of information, timely reporting, and provision of um, data by government institutions can help our societies nurture the democratic process. It is our hope that our partnership with the Editors Forum of Namibia and the government at large will serve as a powerful tool to building flourishing and empowered med mass media in Namibia. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Elzita, and thank you for reminding us of the importance of journalism and press freedom, especially in these trying times. Next up, we'll have an overview and a celebration of the 30 years of press freedom by the representative for UNESCO. And I brought my iPad back up because I just want to make sure I don't do another faux pas on a surname. So Mr. Jafar Musa El Kadum, I have had um, the, oh, I'm very lucky to be sitting right next to him. And considering that we both speak the French language, we had an absolutely lovely exchange, most beautiful language in the world after Namibia's official language. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you very much, merci beaucoup. I was going to say chu. I like that very much. Um, because um, I think Frank sent me a message saying that I have only five minutes. Um, and as I like to add challenge on me, and I say, I ask my, my staff to say, what, what can you give me as an additional challenge? And they give me a list of things that I'm trying to read here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would start by saying, I think this is not at all the way. I don't see people realizing that this is the case. But Metaha, Kharab, no, it's not that. Hudentag, probably. Muhara uh, Nawa, yes, that's probably, I heard people saying there. Muhalapo Nawa. I think I did it well. And merci, bon, bon, bon après-midi, ou bonne soirée. Uh, pas bonne soirée, mais bonsoir. Um, and I thank you very much for, for inviting me for this. But also, I was given the challenge in five minutes to have an overview of the, and the celebration of the 30 years of uh, press freedom. And to do that, I say maybe I will try by first close my eyes and have a dream, knowing how, how tired I am at this moment when we have gone through the whole preparation of the World Press Freedom Day. And I was dreaming about seeing myself in Africa where elections are held transparently and where actually we use the new technology today and new media that we have today to report immediately and be transparent on those, the result of the, what came out from the poll. And I was dreaming about you, the youth in Africa with all the increasing level in terms of literacy, using that properly but also claiming what they are claiming because Africa is changing and we have a huge transformation, social transformation happening new call for transparency, more democracy, stable society, and not moving to hate messages, and uh, also uh, dreaming that current presidents are not changing the constitution, 
because 2020 was a COVID year by saying, no, I didn't use that year. I need to add one more year. Then, of course, I wake up and I realize that Namibia kept the position number one for the, for the index of uh, uh, Reporters Sans Frontières, but they lost one point. And I thought that maybe that point, because the journalists, the media people in, in Namibia and the government stood actually to mobilize Africa for the protection of journalists and for promotion actually of media freedom and safety of journalists. But also, I realized that indeed 30 years has gone since 1991. And but the change of landscape has transformed the world, but also has transformed, has brought many other challenges. But I realize that indeed the World Press Freedom Day is a moment where we bring in those debates and we bring in uh, the, the topic in order to look at how indeed we promote what is necessary in order to support the media, freedom, and democracy. 1991 conference was focused on print media. But 10 years after, the, the World Press Freedom Day highlighted the communication through the airwaves. 20 years after, the focus was on the right to people's universal access to information. Now, 30 years after, we, we, we claim and we say that information is and should be uh, public goods in all sense of the meaning of public goods. Looking at the, the offer, looking at the regulation, but looking also on the other aspects. So, but I realize that indeed my dream come true because when I was appointed as a representative of UNESCO to Namibia, I said one thing I should try and lobby is to make sure that Namibia will not miss this year's celebration. And I'm, so, I'm tired, I'm still tired, but I'm so proud that together we have gone. And together, when I say together with all of you, and I see my, uh, I see my brother Mbota joining us. We have had a lot of talks on that, and I need to congratulate him. And of course, the whole team around the, 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 the preparation of this World Press Freedom Day. The theme, as I said, we all know, it actually to say promote information as a public good. And we have the two sub-themes, viability of media, this is, of course, for you, you are professional, to look at how we look at the issue of the supply of quality information by media outlet, the sustainability, to ensure pluralism. The crisis that we have had the recent years has actually diminished the pluralism that we have. And I'm looking at my watch and I see the eyes of, of uh, Frank, and I say again, choo! I think I'm, I'm going to miss my time. But of course, transparency is important. And we are here, we hear all what we, we know about how to talk publicly about the transmission of content by internet companies, the use of personal individual data. These are issues that will be discussed. But more important also is how do we capacitate the citizens to make sure that they engage properly and consume the public good? I would like to congratulate EFN and the media uh, professionals in, in Namibia for continue celebrating uh, this, uh, the, the, the journalists of the, year, of, the, of, of the year for Namibia. And I wanted to, of course, Congratulate, we'll have the time to congratulate Maria Reza, the 2021 winner of the UNESCO Guillermo Cano. We, there will be session that we'll go through and then she worked hard 
And I believe that in this room and in Namibia, we have nurseries for Ado Maria Reza, probably, and for sure. I would like to congratulate the winners in advance, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, sir. I'd now like to call upon Mr. Frank Steffen. He is the chairperson of the Editors' Forum of Namibia. Um, it is now time for an acknowledgement to Ms. Gwen Lister, who is the executive director of the Namibia Media Trust, a veteran journalist, someone who needs no introduction in this country and in, in the world, actually. Um, and she's also the champion of the World Press Freedom Day 2021. Please welcome Frank to the stage, tallest man in the room. <laughs> good evening and uh, welcome once again. Um, I'd like to say good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, trust that I too can except that protocol has been observed. Just a quick note, um, some of the internet uh, listeners might wonder why we started a moment late, and that was obviously because we tried to cater as much as possible for our special guests, and uh, unfortunately at this stage we're still waiting for the Minister of Information and Communication Technologies, Honorable Pia Mushilenga, but um, he said to me in advance that it might be a bit of a problem because they've got the uh, final voting for the budget 2021-2022. Right, coming to the business while I'm standing here. Um, I'll actually take off my glasses because otherwise I'll start looking like an owl. Some of you might uh, know that I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I suppose the color of my beard gives that away. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that I have been around the block, trust me. The benefit and sometimes disadvantage of aging is that you see and experience things, and the longer that goes on, the more balanced your view of life and its challenges become. Uh, you mellow a bit like good wine. But make no mistake, you need that fast-flowing blood of youth to make your mark in life. And while we cannot all be a Gwen Lister, I will say this. She certainly did not miss her chance to make her indelible mark on Namibia in every manner possible. We have just listened to UNESCO's director, Jaffa Musa El Kadum, and thank you, where is he? Ah, there you are. Uh, who has placed emphasis on the fact that the youth needs to take the torch. Spread your wings and take life by its throat. That is exactly what Gwen Lister did for as long as she's been around. I must admit that I'm glad she was not my child. Boy, that must have been a challenge. No lady likes us talking of her age, but let me assure you, she carries her age well. As a child, she grew up under the apartheid system and later studied for a bachelor's degree at the University of Cape Town. Straight thereafter, she joined the Vintuk Advertiser of those years before she, as a result of interference, please note, in her reporting by her editors, she joined Hannah Smith, who at the time began the independent weekly Vintuk Observer. This was the time when then Southwest Africa took its first tiny steps to get rid of apartheid laws. If you Google her name, you will be able to read that Gwen, and I quote, as political editor wanted to give Swapu a human face, showing the people, including whites, that they were not the terrorists and communists and the black threat that the colonial regime made them out to be through its blanket propaganda." Unquote. Gwen has penned down these experiences in the time leading up to Namibia's independence, and I'm truly looking forward to a book titled Comrade Editor, as she told me the other day. And that is due to be released shortly. If I were to tell you all about it, I suppose I would need days. Suffice to say that Gwen knows exactly what it means to be deprived of the right to freedom of the media. She was exposed to that phenomena from the start, but ever more so once she founded the Namibian in 1985. 
If you've read a book published by Dave Smuts last year, you will know that she even had to make peace with the fact at one stage that the government would not uh, renew her passport. Finally, when they started renewing it again, um, they only replaced it on a yearly basis. So up to, up to the time of independence in 1990, and this is important, she was still part of a hit list of the Civil Cooperation Bureau, the CCB, that functioned as a hit squad of the South African government of the time. I mean, today we can't even imagine that. As we all know, they were successful in murdering Swapo activist Anton Lewowski in 1989 at a time when we were actually getting ready for independence. Now, the Vintic Declaration for the Development of a Free, Independent and Pluralistic uh, Press is a statement of press freedom principles as defined by African newspaper journalists in 1991, as Peter said earlier. It was the result of a UNESCO seminar under the title of Promoting an Independent and Pluralistic African Press, held in Windhoek during the days of 29 April to 3 May 1991. Thirty years down the line, these days sound familiar, don't they? Well, this was a seminar chaired by none other than our Gwen Lister. It was during this time that she co-founded the Media Institute of Southern Africa, MISA, or as you would mostly know it, serving a term as its chair lady. And we're not exactly talking of a Sunday tea club here. Fact is that Gwen has never let down Namibia and never relaxed her strong beliefs in human rights that she regards as a basis for freedom of speech and expression. She has been a pioneer of the free media in Namibia and I dare say in Africa. For that, we are not only grateful, but in fact, we would like to congratulate her for being the person she is. And the small light she once was for press freedom in Africa, a light that, that now continues to shine brighter and brighter across our home continent. Ladies and gentlemen, if ever there was a person who believed in the principle of information as a public good, it certainly must be Gwen Lister. As a token of our appreciation, we would like to hand her a specially made cartoon by Dudley and will shortly agree with her on her choice of visiting one of the lodges of Gondwana collection in Namibia near Sosa's Flay. That will be a weekend for two, which we as media community would like to give to a very special and strong fighter for the freedom of the press. We thank you. If you want. Hopefully it doesn't look like the cartoons in the Republican of the old days. <laughs> but uh, while I do so, may I very kindly thank you, Frank, and the Editors Forum of Namibia for really um, acknowledging uh, my many years, decades in journalism in actual fact and being a chair at the Vinduk Declaration. Um, I think it's true to say that I'm not used to that many compliments, so I begin to perspire heavily if people say nice things about me. So thank you all for those kind words. And, um, you know, it's as um, Mr. El Kadum said earlier, uh, this room is not about us oldies. It's about the young people who are going to be celebrated tonight for their good and great journalism. And may they forever prosper and take the candle of press freedom ever forward. And good journalism couldn't be more necessary in the past than it is today. Ah, there I am. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dudley. That's very appropriate because he was a founder member of the Namibian in 1985 as well. So once again, thank you all very much for this great acknowledgement. And good luck to the winners. Thank you.
I can only imagine that the task of considering all the entries for the Journalism Awards was a challenging one for our adjudicators panel. Really looking forward to hearing from the spokesperson of the adjudicators panel, Mr. Veri Ulefir, who was um, supported by Ms. Nora Apollos and um, Ms. Emily Brown on the panel. Love to hear certain reflections or all the reflections on, on the entries for this year's awards. Please give him a round of applause as he comes to the stage. Well, with the minister not being here, it makes it easier for me to say all protocol observed. Uh, I got shattered at because I didn't have a bow tie. Uh, Peter Denk said he'll give me his when he's finished, but he failed on me. So let me get on to this. Uh, just to start off with, I think a word of thanks to all the journalists. Those of you that had, and this is on behalf of my fellow judges, who have uh, been introduced by the uh, Director of Ceremonies, thank you for entering, thank you for having the guts to enter. You won't know where you will end in the race if you don't enter. Uh, also for the ENF, uh, EFN, for organizing the event. And then, yeah, COVID-19, it's a challenging time for all of us. Uh, so for FNB, despite the difficulties in the world of finance and business, thank you so much for sponsoring this event. Uh, the entries were judged independently and individually in the first instance. So the three judges... We didn't have any contact with each other. We each did our own adjudication independently and separately. And then we came together and we deliberated about on the entries. We compared the scores, we deliberated more, and then we aggregated the scores. And as the director of ceremony said, uh, it was quite a tough job. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a lot more hair than I have now. And they weren't as grey either, because we received more than 130 entries in print and broadcast from over 40 entrants. So it was a big pile of stuff to go through. And our task was made a little bit more difficult, because entries were received for 2019 and 2020, when the awards event didn't take place. Uh, from our side, the adjudicators would have liked to see more diversity of entries from more media houses, more radio stations, more uh, uh, television uh, stations. With regard to the quality of the entries, they were, as one of my fellow adjudicators, uh, Nora Polis, remarked, they were exceptional and they addressed relevant public interest issues. Uh, to say what we mean by exceptional, the average marks for the winners in the various categories were 78%. And there was... So what, that's a cum laude, Professor. That's a cum laude. So the winners, uh, the average there was cum laude. Uh, the average marks, yeah, we spoke about that, and then also the margin between the entries, first, second, third, and even further down the line, was often very small, which made it a little bit more difficult for the three of us. Even Emily has gone a lot more grey than she was two weeks ago. Uh, unfortunately, there can only be one, one winner, so if you did not get the top spot this year, Persevere, don't give up, and work a little bit more harder. Regrettably, a number of entries were disqualified because of the, not the exceptional good quality, but the exceptional poor quality of the scans. And uh, some pages were missing and what have you. And it cannot be expected from the EFN uh, coordinator, Ms. Elizabeth Mule, to get, engage in correspondence to get the stuff in a proper uh, format. Uh, something else, the adjudicators would have liked to see more diversity of sources to provide more equitable gender balance and to avoid relying on the usual stock 
prominent sources, which happened to be probably men a little bit younger than me, but mainly men. Uh, so that requires a little bit more uh, digging to find more diversity of sources. Uh, the adjudicators also felt that some potentially good stories merely provided a platform for the newsmaker or the interviewee to state their point of view without challenging the newsmaker interviewee with probing questions. You know, it's like a talk shop. You've got five minutes. Talk. Uh, we also felt that the significance of community and civic journalism in a country such as Namibia need to be emphasized in order for ordinary voices to be heard on topics pertinent to them, for example, access to health facilities, education, and a host of other things. Although only a relatively few entries were received for the photojournalism category, the quality was excellent, and it was actually a photo finish. No pun intended. It was very hard to find between some very, very exceptional uh, photographs to actually really pin down and uh, get the winner. As my fellow adjudicator, Emily Brown, pointed out, we used to say that the story, in this case print, is incomplete without the picture. We felt that newsrooms should have a mentor who would advocate for the value of the pictorial message. You know these days with cell phones, ne? We see them at the news conferences. They just stand like that. Uh, but for those that entered into the photojournalism journalism category, excellent stuff. Uh, within the next few days, the adjudicators will submit the report to the EFN with the recommendations relating to the improvement of a few administrative issues as well as the various categories for consideration. Thank you. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, some, some great input in terms of how to make these entries even better. We're now going to get to that moment we've all been waiting for, which is the Journalism Awards. You can see many of you sitting here starting to sit a little bit more uncomfortably in your seats. I love the excitement. I'm going to just give you a sense of how we'll handle these awards. We'll start with the category of the entry, and then the name of the journalist who entered the cat category, then the publication he or she represented, as well as the name of the article. The winner will then come on stage to receive his or her certificate, and they will receive the prize money of 10,000 Namibian dollars sponsored by our sole sponsor, F&B, and that will be deposited directly into the winner's account. I'm going to start, yes, I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Our first award is the Investigative Exposé Award, and it is awarded for the most compelling, incisive, and graphic public interest investigation of the year. I'd like to ask Elzita Bierkes and Gary Stöbel from C uh, the CEO of the Future Media to please join me on stage as I quickly run through our nominees. The nominees are Adolf Kaure, Namibia Media Holdings for the article Poor Hygiene at Henty's Bay Isolation Facility. Eliaser de Yanyale, the Namibian Nast Family Affair. Kenya Kamboe, also from the Namibian, for four different um, publications, Four Years Under a Tree, then Hopeless and Destitute, Same Old, Same Old, and Willem's 30 Kilometer Walk. Jemima Jeanette Liberty Bierkes for the Namibian Sun, Controversy Engulfs Zim Test Kit Donation. Shinoven Emmanuel from the Namibian, Kickback Kings, before anyone wakes up, we need to move. Sonia Smith, the Namibian, Online Daily Maverick, Online Center for Collaborative Journalism, Government Splashes 10 million on Idol website. Guys, these titles. <laughs> <laughs> Tileni Mongudi and Matthias Haufiku from the Namibian for a number of articles, the first one being Fish Rot Mastermind, The Rise and Fall of James Hatwikilipi. The second one, The Three Musketeers. Tim Shihepo, also from the Namibian, Fish Rot Fashionista. 
Ngipunya's Rise and Reckoning, to Leni Pinyas from the Namibian for the article, The Spoils of Fish Rot. Selma Taipopi, One Africa Television, for two different publications. The first one, Serious Allegations Plague the Namibian National Gallery of Namibia, Ugh. the National Art Gallery of Namibia, Leadership, let me try that again. The first article, Serious Allegations Plague the Namibian National Art Gallery Leadership. The second one, NPPTA, Namibia Public Passenger Transport Association and NAPTA, the Namibia Bus and, and Taxi Association, lock horns over lockdown operation fee for public transport. Erika Gepat, One, Afri one Africa TV Online for two different publications, hashtag NSARS, and the second one, New Cabinet, Corruption and Coronavirus. Isai Sipunga, One Africa Television, local entrepreneur kept hostage by Ministry of Works and Transport. This was a three-part series. Shomye, excuse me, Shombe Shanyengana, New Era Alive, excuse me, New Era Live, YouTube. Communities want improved radio network coverage. Lerato Kobetsi Slinger from the Namibian. Kalkran families struggle to bury their dead. And the winner is... I'm the lady with the tool in the hand. For the category Investigative Journalism Award, the winner is none other, Shinovel Emmanuel, publication The Namibian. Kick back, Kings, before everyone wakes up, we need to move. I told you Alzita looked great. Now she stays with me on stage. Our second category is the Health Matters Award. This goes to the journalist or broadcaster who has written an exceptional news story or feature or who has produced a brilliant commentary on a health pandemic such as the novel coronavirus COVID-19. I'd like to ask Gary to come back on stage. Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. The nominees are Adolf Kaure, Namibia Media Holdings, Namibia has no coronavirus, coronavirus equipment, Arlana Shikongo, also the Namibian, two separate publications, Hepatitis E Ravages Comas for the first one, and COVID-19 Prisons Try to Keep Virus Out for the second one. Blanche Goroses from the NBC, first publication, Rehoboth Placed Under Lockdown Over COVID-19, and the second one, Marintal Defy COVID-19 Regulations. Charlotte Nambaja, also the Namibian. The first one, An Evening at Katutura Hospital's Casualty Department, and the second one, My Hepatitis E Experience. David Bishop, Future Media Radio Wave for Corona Watch. Irvin Leuschner, Allgemeine Zeitung and Republikain for Blunt About Mistakes. Henriette Lamprecht from the Republican for two sides of the quarantine coin and beyond breaking point. Josefina Shikongo Mwashidange, New Era Facebook, YouTube for COVID-19, the dilemma of parental home teaching. Kenya Kambove, Namibian Sun for too poor to buy pads, pittance for DNA testing, and villages expose healthcare workers. Jemima Jeanette Liberty Bierkes from the Namibian Sun for contacts of corona patients lost and Kamwi calls for mass diagnostic testing. Maria Nduvundi David, Informante Online for elephant dung sales peak at height of COVID-19. Sonia Smith, the Namibian Online Daily Maverick, Online Center for Collaborative Journalism, Government Opens Borders to Angolans. Selma Taipopi, One Africa Television, 
Health Ministry disappoints Okuriangava residents and regional towns to receive COVID-19 isolation centers. Erika Gepat, One Africa Television Online, The Woes of the Vending Woman Story, and Corona Will Humble Us. Leston Voller, also from One Africa Television. Media paints false image about Greiter Center, Williams Legal Practitioners, and Gengop con contradicts state of emergency. Shombe Shanyengana, NBC TV YouTube, for wearing masks and social distancing remain a challenge in the South. And the winner is... Actually, let's applaud all those nominees first. The Health Journalism Award goes to... Who do you think it goes to? Wieserud? Nah, nah, it's a lady. Charlotte Nambaja, publication, The Namibian. An evening at Katutura Hospital's Casualty Department. Well done. Thank you so much. You may now depart. <laughs> Elzita, you'll stay here with me? Partner. Okay, yes, my partner. <laughs> Our next category is the Agriculture and Environment Award, and I'd like to ask Taleni Shimpopoleni to join us on stage to assist with the handover of the next two categories. This award goes to the journalist or broadcaster who has written an exceptional news story or feature or who has produced a captivating documentary on an agricultural or environmental issue in Namibia. The nominees are Arlana Shikongo, the Namibian, for Crocodiles Show Up Dead on Kunene Riverbanks and Season of Seals, A Harvest, Not Cull. Francoise Steinberg, Republicains Facebook, for Interview on Pangolin Conservation. Hilma Hashange from the Ministry of Information, Communication and Technology, Hardap, New Era. For heavy losses and salary cuts, pandemic takes toll on Hardap tourism and hydroponic fodder system slowly growing momentum. Josefina Shikongo Mwashidange, New Era Facebook and YouTube for pensioner ventures into rice farming. Communal farmers flock to Oshivelo for fodder. Itosha's King Nehale Lodge to open soon, and Oshikoto chips in financially for destitute farmers. Paula Christoph Casey from Future Media Fresh FM for Tour Namibia Karas region. Maria Ndivundi David Informante Online for Namibia's Asparagus Goes to Europe. Sonia Smith, the Namibian Online Daily Maverick, Online Center for Collaborative Journalism for Dying for a Drop, Vineyards pampered, farm workers struggle, and grape crop brings in millions, but farm workers live harsh life. Tileni Mongudi and Matthias Haufiku from the Namibian for wildlife guardians probed and mining water wars. Timo Shihepo, also from the Namibian, for government's 10, 10 billion Namibian dollar deal linked to South African businessmen. Hendrina Cagnolo, One Africa Television, for locals deem green worms a seasonal delicacy. Leston Voller also won Africa Television for over 900,000 cannabis farms in South Africa. And SOS Soapbox Derby promotes recycling. And the winner is... The nominees... And the winner is for the Journalism Award for Agriculture and Environment awarded to Sonia Smith.
<laughs> but we can still applaud you on her behalf, yeah? Okay, she's not here this evening, but she's well represented. Let's give her a round of applause. No, 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 Kaleni, Kaleni. Our next category is the Business, Finance and Innovation Award. And it goes to the journalist or broadcaster who has written a story or produced a document on an innovative business venture of an exceptional quality. The nominees are Adolf Kaure, Namibia Media Holdings, Feed the Hungry with Fish. David Bishop, Future Media, Radio Wave, for interview on the launch of new education qualifications in Namibia by the Stadio Faculty of Education. Eliasser Ndeyanale, the Namibian, for NDF firm in $14 million Namibian dollar fraud case. Lazarus Amukeshe, the Namibian, for bank face, banks face property loan stress and competition threat in Chinese Ohorongo takeover. Sonia Smith, the Namibian, online daily maverick, online center for collaborative tourism, for motorists to pay seven billion Namibian dollars for fuel storage. Joseph Ilonga from One Africa Television for civil societies haunted by upper middle class income classification. Isai Sipunga, One Africa TV, for local pharmaceutical industry could come to, to its knees, says Nam Farm CEO. This was a two part series. Lerato Kobetsi Slinger from MICT Hardap region, the Namibian, Dreams come true for Arano's family. And the winner is... <laughs> In the category Business Finance and Innovation Award, the winner is... It is an L, but it's Lerato Hobetsi Slinger, publication New Era for Dream Come True for Arano's family. A round of applause for her. Is she not here? Okay, let's give her another round of applause. Our next category, oh, thank you, Taleni. <laughs> I'd now like to call on Gerald Jor to come and do the next two handovers with us. Our next category is the Sports Award. Not here? Okay. Then you're going to hand over the award. You're the sole sponsor. Yes. <laughs> so the Sports Award honors excellence in the coverage of sport. The story of production is required to be compelling and ethical, as per the Namibian Code of Ethics, and hold those involved in sport accountable. Collaborative entries are also accepted. The nominees are... Herson Kapanga, Nampa and New Era. Financially crippled NFA still owes Brave Warriors money. Jesse Kaura from the Namibian Sun for two publications. The first, Left for Dead to Rise Again. And the second, Manetti can reapply. Shifeni Nicodemus, the Namibian for NSC Defends Horror Youth Games. And Players Starve as Greedy Bosses Jostle for Supremacy. Timo Shihepo from the Namibian for ACC probe into football gravy train widens. Castro Ulumbu, One Africa Television for self-taught gymnast awarded scholarship and Golden Girl points out discipline and dedication for her success. Let's give those nominees a round of applause. And the winner of the Sport Journalism Award is Timo Shihepo from the Namibian for ACC Probe into Football Gravy Train Widens. Our Photojournalism Award is an award for a compelling photograph or a series of photographs that tell an ethical and quality story. 
The nominees are Emensi Nukala from New Era for two publications, Daily Struggle and Happy Chappy. Erwin Leuschner from Allgemeine Zeitung and Republikan, who you know, for Gesetzesänderung angestrebt, depicts elephants running over a part of the Etosha and Küste bleibt verriegelt, which means Swakop unites. Hershon Kapanga for, from Nampa and New Era for Beatrice Masilingi and Arjola Dedaj. James Jamu, freelancers for the Namibian, for Zambezi fishermen fear shadow of death and the new normal COVID-19 in the streets of Vintuk. Tati Nilenge from the Namibian for things we lost in the fire. Walter Kariko from the Namibian for three different publications. Am I next? Hashtag shut all down and down by the riverside. And the winner is... And the winner is, for the Photojournalism Award, put your hands together for Tati Nilenge, the Namibian Things We Lost in the Fire. We now come to the Best Political and Public Governance Issues Award. A journalist or broadcaster who has written an exceptional news story or feature, or who has produced a brilliant documentary on a political or government governance issue. I'd like to call Mr. Stanley Similo, the Director General of the Namibia Broadcasting Corporation, to assist us with this handover. I didn't see him earlier. Elzita, I told you, babes, it's you and me tonight. And our nominees are Arlana Shikongo, the Namibian, for two publications, Political Parties Focus on Reviving Agriculture, and the second one, Aid, No Compromise for Reparations. Blanche Goreses from the Namibia Broadcasting Corporation, President Gengob's first term cabinet appointments and reshuffles. David Bishop, Future Media Radio Wave, interview with Dr. Itula on the launch of his new political party. Eliaser Ndeyanale, the Namibian, Fish Gore paid ESO's advisor. Josefina Shikonga, Shik, eh, Josefina Shikongo Mwashidange for New Era Facebook, YouTube, Okashana Strives for Vision 2030. Paula Christoph Casey for Future Media, Fresh FM, Security and Border Issue. Kenya Kambove, Namibian Sun for Marginalized Community Gets Houses Without Toilets. Laimi Elago, Future Media Radio Wave for how Namibia can better discuss race and race-based policies versus meritocracies. Jemima Jeanette Liberty Birkus from the Namibian Sun for Power to the People and Hage Throws Jerry a Bone. Shifeni Nicodemus, the Namibian for Forgotten Hero, Para-Athlete Struggles to Survive on Meager Resources. Sonia Smith for the Namibian Online Daily Maverick, Online Center for Collaborative Journalism, EVM's voting machines go missing, and NAMCOR pays 2.2 million Namibian dollars into wrong account. Joseph Ilonga, One Africa Television, the process of freezing their accounts has already started, Paulus Noah, and is transparency international unfair towards African countries? Tileni Mongudi and Matthias Haufiku from the Namibian for firstly, government targets inheritance money and 75 years and counting. Edelbet Mukena from One Africa Television for PDM Blast's excessive spending by senior government officials. Isai Sipunga, One Africa Television for Al Jazeera Unraveled What We've Been Saying All Along, AR. Leston Voller from One Africa Television for We Will Deal With You. We have all the money, Shaningwa tells Itula. Fish rot, and the second one, Fish Rot Scandal, gives Gengop sleepless nights. Let's give those nominees a great round of applause. And 
our and our winner is for the category best political and public governance award who do you think say again Matthias Haufiku and Tileni Mongudi, the Namibian, 75 years and counting. You've already heard from the spokesperson of the adjudicator panel, Mr. Vili Ulefir. None of the entries complied to the criteria for this category, and therefore, there is no winner in this category. Elzita, I'd like to thank you very much for joining me on stage. You may take a seat. <laughs> and I now have the honor of calling our guest speaker on stage, the Honorable Minister, Dr. Pea Mushelenga, to deliver his address. Please give him a round of applause. Yeah, director of ceremonies, all protocol observed. I am glad to join the EFN night and their annual prize giving function to journalists that have performed well in various categories. Journalism is an old profession dating back to 59 before the current era. The well-known product of journalism by then was the actor Juma, which was more or less comparable to today's government gazettes, where public speeches were circulated at public places. Private publications came much later, around the 15th century, you had businessmen from Germany and Italy that started recording about events that were happening in their businesses and circulating them. And they were then handwritten with the printing press coming in the next century. But today, journalism has evolved to a level whereby journalists are put through academic training at various institutions, and the private journalism has increased to the level of well-established media houses world over. A function like this is indeed commendable for the editors to think about rewarding journalists that have performed well in various categories. As I was going through various categories, there is one area that I think also need a focus in the future. As an African, the first thing that comes to my mind is culture. And this is a very important area that I think also need to be recognized. We have people involved in promoting issues related to culture 
even those that are trading, when you go around to various places, you find wood carving and so th those are cultural promotions. And I think journalists that focus on that need to be recognized and you need to have a category. So when I look at sport, immediately I thought of culture. Journalism can also only be feathered when you have ongoing training like all other fields. That media houses put their staff in staff development programs in short or long-term training programs where they can enhance their skills and improve on their professionalism. It is also a gesture they will appreciate as one of the incentives that when you also perform well, you are also sent on further training so that you can improve better. Over and above what we are doing tonight, by giving them prizes. And as I said, any prize giving ceremony in any sector serves as a source of incentive for better performance. There is nothing that satisfies an individual than being recognized for what you are doing. When you are a student and you are a best performer and you get the best uh, student award, or when you are working for a company, whether you get long service award or best performing award, this serves to motivate you as a person. But not only you, but even those that are coming after you. They know if I am performing better, there is room for recognition. And for those that have received awards, I would like to congratulate you. And don't become complacent because this is an annual event. Others are looking forward to these enviable prices to come and snatch them next time. And also for those that were nominated but did not make it, final choice, I encourage you, do not give up, continue, so that next time it can be you that will be receiving these awards. I'm glad to see veteran journalists here and I believe their presence here serves to testify that they continue to mentor the upcoming journalists in their own humble but meaningful way, wherever they may find themselves. So with these words, I once more congratulate the recipients and commend the EFN for this award, but reminding them the category that I said you must add to your categories. I thank you. Honorable Minister, thank you very much for that address. We'd now like to move to the keynote address this evening, which is from Anton Harbour entitled Journalism Under Pressure from Within and Without. Allow me a few moments to introduce him. He's been a journalist for 40 years in many capacities as a reporter, editor, manager, educator, trainer, columnist, and comment commentator, working in print, television, radio, and the internet. A founder and editor of the anti-apartheid newspaper, The Weekly Mail, Mail and Guardian, and editor-in-chief of the country's leading TV news station, ENCA. At eMedia and as CEO of Cajiso Broadcasting, he gained experience managing large budgets and groups of people in a corporate environment 
and also considerable experience in the governance of nonprofits. And for many years, he's been an activist for journalism and media freedom. As the chair of Africa Czech and a board member of the Global Investigative Journalism Network and Center for Collaborative Jour Investigative Journalism. He holds the Caxton Chair of Journalism at the University of Advartashrant as adjunct professor, where he teaches courses in journalism history and investigative journalism. He also runs the Henry Humalo Fund for Investigative Journalism and the Taco Caper Award for Investigative Journalism. Public knowledge, Anton has won several national and international journalistic awards and has published several books, eight of which won Diepslut, has won the Recht Malan Literary Award in 2012. Anton will be selling some of his books this evening outside, and if I got the number right, it was 200, right? Yes, okay. I was gonna give it 300, but you know, 200, yes, okay. And I'm sure he'll be very happy to sign your book. And when we have refreshments just after the, the proceedings, um, I'm sure he'll take the time to do that. Jacob Lamini in part remarked that Anton, is a pioneer of independent journalism in South Africa and one of the keenest observers of the media around. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anton Haber to deliver his keynote address on journalism under pressure from within and without. I hope you don't mind if I take that off so that you can hear me clearly. <coughs> Phew, sure, that was quite an introduction to live up to. I'll try and make my speech shorter than that. It's wonderful, let me say, a great pleasure to be here tonight. It's a great pleasure to have traveled out of South Africa for the first time in 18 months. It's a great pleasure to see good journalism being honored and recognized and to see so many um, new young faces taking the baton and producing such interesting work. It's wonderful to be here to express solidarity with fellow editors and journalists. Um, I want to add my voice to what was said about Gwen. Gwen and I go back a long way. Uh, I think we both started newspapers in 1985, if I'm correct. Um, three months difference. And, 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 uh, and have been in touch ever since. And uh, it's wonderful to see her honored in this way. So thank you for inviting me tonight. Let's hope that gatherings like this signal the beginning of an emergence from a dark time when we've been battered by the global pandemic, which came on top of already punishing economic conditions in our industry. I can't speak for conditions in Namibia, but I can tell you that in South Africa, we've had mass retrenchments and closures in the media industry, and things have not looked as bleak for a long time. Let me say that on the economic front, I believe that we have, in this industry, reached a nadir, and we might be seeing the signs of a rebuilding of a refreshed business model for this troubled industry. And we all take great hope from the fact that even under these severe conditions, some excellent investigative and expose and other work has been done to hold the powerful in our countries to account. In South Africa, where many of our institutions of democracy have taken a battering in recent years, and accountability reached an all-time low a couple of years ago. The one institution that remained independent and firm in holding power to account was the media, or at least elements of the media. And that's what I want to talk about today. The fact that some elements of our news media continue to produce important and valuable work, building trust and support for what we do, but there are elements which are deliberately undermining our work with shoddy, dishonest, partisan, factional, malicious work that undermines our trust and credibility. 
In South Africa, we have media houses who have gone rogue, opting out of the self-regulatory system that we've built over many years, collapsing, leaving and collapsing industry organizations, and feeling free as a result to publish the most partisan, tendentious, dishonest material that serves only the interests of their owners, their publishers, and their friends and partners in business and politics. We're all aware, particularly at the time when we're marking 30 years since the Vintuk Declaration, we're all aware of the external threats to journalism and the news industry, and I've mentioned some of these. We are seeing a new arsenal in the hands of those who would undermine our work and our credibility, using the capacity of social media to harass journalists, particularly women journalists, and to spread disinformation that undermines our work. We are seeing governments actively undermine critical journalism and outlets and support those who are less critical. But we also need to talk about those within our industry and our profession who damage the trust and credibility we need to do our work. That is part of what I wrote my recent book about, confronting the difficulties within our circle of journalists. My book, so for the record, took a close look at the media that enabled state capture in South Africa, wittingly or unwittingly, as well as the media that helped bring in, put the brakes on it and help end the era of, and that particular presidency that was enabling state capture. This was not an easy thing to do. As I was pointing out the very severe failings of some of my colleagues and friends, my book centers on how South Africa's biggest and most powerful newspaper got so arrogant and careless, so set in their ways at a time when journalism was changing, so apparently impervious to the changes around them that they blundered badly, not once, not twice, but in a series of dozens of stories over many months for which they had to apologize and withdraw. It was a devastating time for them, but it hurt everyone in journalism. It was the biggest and most powerful newspaper in the country. And what they did is now always used to throw shade on us when we do good stuff. It hurt a lot of good public officials who had been doing their job and who were undermined by their stories, some of the best. It hurt the whole country in that enabled the state capture project, furthered the state capture project at enormous cost to our economy. What I did in writing such a book was, I think, unusual, certainly in this part of the world. I investigated the investigators and I applied to them the scrutiny they apply to others who wield power. I know there was previously an unwritten agreement that we were cautious about criticizing each other in the media. But I think this was unhealthy. It fed an arrogance and imperviousness that was damaging to our credibility and our standing. There are those who call this emerita who would say I betrayed them, that I gave ammunition to those who aim to undermine and compromise the media. We know there's no shortage of such people. But my hope is that my book encourages a new era of self-scrutiny and mutual criticism that makes us more transparent and accountable for what we do. We don't want to be accountable to governments. We don't want to be accountable to politicians. We want to be accountable to society, to our colleagues, to our peers, to our constitutions, to the law. And, and for that reason, we have to speak out and make ourselves accountable in those ways. I think we know that we are facing, globally and locally, a loss of trust in journalism. Some of this is due to factors outside of our control, such as those who maliciously use disinformation to undermine us and our work. 
But often we have not helped ourselves in that we have allowed too much shoddy journalism which undermines us and our work, eats away at that trust that we depend on so much. We need to be the bulwark against disinformation, not the purveyors, fighting disinformation with good, credible, fact-based journalism. We need, I think, to emphasize two things. We wield public power, and with that comes the need to use that power well and effectively for the public good. We must still remain cheeky and provocative and push the boundaries, but we must remind ourselves that we're given this power and freedom to serve the public good. We need to refocus our journalism on that practice of a public good. For me, that, holds, that means holding power to account, giving voice to the voiceless. Secondly, the days of shrugging off and ignoring criticism are over. Social media has empowered our friends and our critics to confront us when we make errors, to hold us accountable, and to force transparency on us. We've got to acknowledge that this is a new age of transparency in journalism, and it's a word we've heard a few times tonight. And we have to take that on board if we're going to rebuild trust. It's not easy. It's challenging, for sure. But certainly the lesson from the Sunday Times in my book was that if you don't embrace this change, if you don't embrace transparency and accountability, it's going to catch up with you fast. Let me just say briefly that I think it's important to say that transparency in journalism operates at a number of levels. At its most basic is the declaration of potential conflicts of interest. You might know that in South Africa, the inquiry headed by former judge Cathy Satchwell, which had, was set up by our National Editors Forum, called for newsroom registers of interests of journalists, much as we expect of judges or politicians. The second level of transparency is, I think, the growing need to provide the supporting documentation for your stories. Ama Bungani, which is perhaps our leading investigative unit in South Africa, responsible centrally for the all-important Gupta Leak story that um, really exposed state capture. They now provide evidence folders online when they publish their stories. It includes copies of background documents, transcripts of interviews, other material which allows everyone the chance to give close scrutiny of the evidence behind their stories. It's just one example. The third level of transparency is transparency in how you do and report your story. I think it's no longer sufficient to publish just the results of an investigation, but increasingly it's essential to show how you got there, how you found the information, how you verified it, and why the audience should believe it. They can't just any longer take your word for it, that this is trustworthy and believable. You have to take them along. You have to take the public along in that process. Many of you will know the groundbreaking um, podcast, Serial, um, which starts with the idea that perhaps the person in prison who's at the center of the story has been wrongfully imprisoned. She doesn't do the investigation and then present it. She takes you on the investigation with her. And it was pioneering work that I think changed the way we do stories and the way we think about how we do stories. Interestingly, in the end, she didn't quite reach a conclusion. So if it was conventional style, it wouldn't have been much of a story. But it was a fantastic story because she took you along the way and allowed you to make up your own mind as a listener, and it was an extraordinary example of something that's now becoming much more common in how we do journalism. And I think there's one more element that I felt strongly in doing my book because I was dealing, as I said, with my friends and colleagues, not all of whom wanted to talk to me, um, all of whom made conditions, sometimes tough in talking to me, 
most of whom stopped talking to me. But it, for me, it was a lesson in how you have to deal as honestly and openly as you can with your sources and your subjects, not misleading them about what you are doing and why you are doing it. Um, it's hard. I, none of this is easy. Let me state that absolutely clearly. I don't want to be trite about it. I know, I certainly found in my book, it was challenging and it was demanding. I'm not sure I always lived up to the standards I'm talking about. But we do have to become as transparent in our work as we expect of others who wield power and to be prepared to account for the decisions we make that affects others. We make decisions all the way in the journalistic process. Who we talk to, how we quote them, how we describe them, what parts we use, what parts we don't use, what context we give the story. It's all a series of important decisions that shape and change and frame the story. We have to be prepared to account for those decisions. And we need to hold each other to account. Much better to correct our own problems that leave it to others out there who are hostile and will use it to better us. Let me say that none of this means we must get too serious and not enjoy what we do. The best journalism is still disruptive, provocative, discomforting, cheeky, pushing the boundaries all the time. We've seen much of it tonight, and that's why it gets rewarded. We just have to make sure that when we make trouble, we do it from firm ground. The good news is that we are seeing a flourishing of investigative journalism across much of Africa. At WITS, we've just done a mapping exercise which is about to be published on our website, that tracks the hubs of investigative journalism across sub-Saharan Africa. And we were surprised, and you know, I follow this closely. I run the annual African Investigative Journalism Conference. I was surprised to see how it's flourishing in many sub-Saharan African countries and further afield, mostly in non-profit, standalone units that are popping up in many countries and supported by foundations, philanthropists, and um, wealthy people who understand the importance of investigative journalism. It is a time when the online, digital, the open source tools of investigative journalism are more powerful than ever. Powerful for those who want to do harm, but powerful for us too who want to counter that harm, who want to do good, I hope. So, in short, we face difficult and challenging times, but also very exciting times. And I wish you all well in celebrating this. Thank you. Wow. What a powerful recognition of all that you do in the journalism industry. Reminders of integrity, various levels of transparency, and to still have fun doing what you do, being responsible. Something that really struck me was when, when you said we need to hold power to account and at the same time be the voice of the voiceless. Thank you so much for that. Let's give him another round of applause. The time has come for the announcement of the Journalist of the Year Award. Um, and as I introduce it, I'd like to ask our Honorable Minister, Dr. Pea Mushelenga from the Ministry of Information, Communication and Technology to join me on stage, Dr. John Nakuta, who is the Media Ombudsman, Elzita Birkes representing First National Bank, and Frank Steffen, the Chairperson of the Editors' Forum of Namibia. Ladies and gentlemen, this award, this well sought after Journalist of the Year Award, recognizes the journalist who has consistently written or produced outstanding ethical and quality journalism works throughout the year of adjudication. As such, journalists cannot enter for this prestigious award. It's up to the panel of adjudicators. They select the Journalist of the Year from the entries they've received in the various categories. 
They, the, the journalist of the year wins 20,000 Namibian dollars. Again, this is proof that our sole sponsor, First National Bank, is very committed towards enhancing the media's role in democracy through good quality and ethical journalism. I'm going to ask the Honorable Minister to hand over that award for us. And the Journalist of the Year Award 2021 goes to Sonia Smith, the Namibian, for Vineyard's Pampered Farm Workers Struggle. Grape crop brings, brings in millions, but farm workers live harsh life. Please give a round of applause. Yes, I'm pleased to give to Sonia's representative here. I wish she was here herself to the Journalist of the Year Award from the Editors Forum of Namibia. We've almost reached the end of our formal proceedings after which we invite you to join us for refreshments just outside and then let's make sure we get home before we get forced home. <laughs> our vote of gratitude will be by Toivo Njebela, the co-champion for the World Press Freedom Day 2021, delivered on behalf of the Editors Forum of Namibia. Please welcome him to the stage. So Frank, I thought uh, this thing would be like this because you were the first guy to speak. So it means our height is <laughs> we are on par. <laughs> uh, good evening, and um, thank you very much for the um, uh, <laughs> yeah. So sorry, I'm. I'm uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity, um, Director of Ceremonies. Um, I just have the simplest job tonight, you know, and uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I wanted first and foremost to uh, congratulate again Gwen Lister, who is uh, my, my co-champion for the uh, 2021 uh, World Press Freedom Day. Um, one of my career regrets is, is not having worked with her or under her, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, so working with her for this project is the closest <laughs> uh, I've had to work with her. Um, you know, Gwen is a mentor to my mentors, uh, and, and that perhaps describes the, uh, the generational gap between us. <laughs> I don't mean to make you... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the, the fact that I was mentored myself by Gwen's protégés uh, for me means that uh, she has done an incredible job in this industry. And uh, what we saw here tonight, uh, that token is, is, is fitting. So congratulations, Gwen. Yeah. The, the second point was to really just say to the colleagues that every, everybody tonight was a, was a winner. Um, uh, congratulations, of course, to, the, to those who got the actual awards. But uh, um, congratulations also to those that were in the running uh, for these awards. 
in 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 uh, in your your USA's and the UK's they they will talk about the Oscar nominated um, actor who never won really, but you know it becomes part of their resume the fact that they were they were in the running for that so. I want to see it that way also that that those that uh, did not scoop their awards tonight that uh, they shouldn't do they shouldn't be uh, discouraged from um, doing even better next year so that um, they become the actual winners. But it's the night for the winners tonight, and uh, congratulations to them. So yes, thank you, thank you. So um, in terms of now, really to give a word of thanks, I wanted to. Um, uh, it's not in, in any particular order, really, but I thought at number one I must place the, uh, the journalists themselves, not only those that were up for their awards tonight, but those that have carried the industry in its most difficult moment in our lifetime, uh, COVID, uh, having been um, part of the frontline uh, people that, you know, uh, throw your your, yourselves to the front uh, to confront uh, news events uh, during that period of time. So to the industry, the, the winners that are here tonight and the contenders and everybody that was not even remotely in the running for the awards, I thought I should uh, take my hat for you for the, the job well done. Um, and then of course our generous sponsor uh, our sole general sponsor, uh, FNB. You know, businesses this year are all hiding behind this huge blanket of COVID-19, which is not a, it's not, it's not unfounded that that indeed uh, COVID has affected businesses. But those of you that are still willing to come to the party, especially for an industry that plays a very critical role in the nurturing and feeding of our democracy, I think we really, really appreciate your generous uh, 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 contribution. So thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> and then when I was driving here, I got a call from the minister, uh, Dr. Piam Shalenga, and uh, he was saying, um, I must convey her apologies to Frank, the chairperson of the Editors Forum, because he was stuck at some budget event, uh, but he still made it to the event, uh, to our event. Um, and I know what uh, Dr. Michelenga has been um, up to lately, uh, being uh, co-chairperson of uh, some of the organizing activities of the um, 2021 World Press Freedom Day. So the fact that he can still spare time to be with us tonight uh, and even hand over the, some of the awards tonight, it's, it's appreciated very much. Yeah. And then uh, Mr. Haba, uh, who has uh, traversed from the south of the Orange to be with us here tonight. I thought your keynote address was very, very important uh, because there is something totally different that we don't hear, which is self-critique. Self um, the fact that you put yourself on the line for criticism by your industry colleagues for really saying, look, why don't we pause and, and look at ourselves? Uh, I thought that was very brave. But being here tonight also very, very important for us. We, we appreciate your time, sir. Mm -hmm. And then we have... Uh, the men that uh, I'm working closely with lately because of our duties, Gwen and I's duties for the uh, championing of the, uh, of the World Press Freedom Day, and that is Mr. Uh, Jafar. Uh, <laughs> Musa al <-Kadum. laughs> Yeah, uh, whom, I mean, he, he's been um, agitating tonight about how exhausted he is, and um, I, I know for a fact why that is the case, because I know how he's been running around. I mean, I was with him the day before yesterday, um, where we were part of the panel discussing um, the events that are coming up, and after the broadcast, he said to me and Gwen that um, 
he is putting down fires essentially because you know you put down one flame here and then another one uh, erupts somewhere else <laughs> so i i can understand uh musa why that has been a, a very taxing time for you uh even those of us that are playing peripheral roles can feel the 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 exhaustion so i can only imagine how it is for you so thank you sir for being here tonight And then, of course, um, the adjudicators, the judges for these awards, uh, have worked under Vili. Where is Vili now? Oh, he's still here. You know, Vili, you've become so uh, young since you retired. So much that now you know, I'm just confusing you with uh, the younger ones there behind. So it's good to see you, Vili, my good friend. Um, but you and uh, the rest of the panel you did a, a very brilliant job. Uh, Emmy Brown. Um, so we appreciate your judgment and uh, your independent minds to come to the conclusions that you've come to. Uh, thank you very much. And then the, um, the editor's forum of Namibia, of course, Frank, uh, Mr. Peter Denk of Liverpool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, know, <laughs> you know, Liverpool is so good that now that they are in a slump, you use every opportunity to get to guys like Peter. <laughs> yeah, so um, a, a, sp a splendid uh, job uh, from you and I call Elizabeth, I, I, I call her a mother. Uh, I think that is even how her name is saved in my phone because... Uh, I worked with her uh, in my formative years. Uh, she was my sub-editor and she was so kind to me. Uh, she treated me like a son. And uh, she's still in, uh, treating the industry uh, like uh, a mother figure of all of us and we appreciate that. But, but the Editors Forum really to see the need to have these awards. Um, I mean, we, we want to have these awards consistently. I know it's a lot of times it's a question of resources. Uh, but when we have our good friends like FMB uh, and other corporates who, who can be inspired by El Zita and Tim, uh, we can only hope that this will be a consistent uh, annual award. But it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, I mean, as editors, we know what uh, our reporters go through every day. And just to recognize that, in the, even in the smallest ways, I think it goes a long way to shape their aspirations to even do better. So, so thank you very much, uh, Editors Forum. I would uh, then close off uh, by thanking the uh, wonderful and energetic and, and very active uh, Director of Ceremonies. <laughs> for the leadership that you've provided tonight uh, uh, in a, a very uh, in a night of so much um, uh, what is the English expression is it um, you know people be, people be, being seated on the edge of their of their of their chairs not knowing whether they will win their awards and not uh, and what not and um, somehow you've been able to lower the temperatures in the room and we appreciate that a lot. Yeah, I do not know if I have... Uh... Oh yes, uh, our Secretary General, of course, Ronel. Uh, so sorry. Uh, when I mentioned the Editors Forum, I wanted to just make it... Uh, it's because it's uh, such a wonderful big team. It's not a big team. But uh, of course, I didn't want to go into individual names. But I think the Secretary General deserves a special mention. She's been... Uh, very, very, very active. I went to Ronel this morning and I said, look, you've sent me a flurry of emails and I haven't responded to a single one of them. Uh, not because I, uh, <laughs> I'm rude. I thought it was this it's crazy time right now. Um, but the fact that she took time to really make sure that uh, I also, that, that it, it becomes easy for me tonight. I appreciate that. But it's not about me. It's really about the broader work that you've done uh, for the for the forum during the period under review. So we, we recognize and appreciate that.
So if there's any omission, I swear to God, it's not a deliberate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Toivo, especially for your, your very kind words to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the formal proceedings for the 2021 Editors Forum of Namibia, Namibia Journalism Awards. Thank you all so much for your kind attention and participation in this beautiful evening. We'll have some refreshments outside. There's also a special table for complimentary wines that has been sponsored by Komnik and Frank. Let's give them a round of applause. We also have a cash bar for you. We would like to once again thank the sole sponsor of the event, FNB Namibia. Thank you very much for the contribution. To our contributors, I'm Weinberg Boutique Hotel for this venue, Komnik and Frank for the complimentary wines, and Namibia Media Holdings oh, for live, stre live streaming this event. My name is Afra Shiming Chase. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting you this evening. I would like to congratulate each and every one of you for entering these awards. And for those of you who've won, thank you for carrying this Namibian flag so high. Keep doing so. And to the panel, thank you for what you've done. Have a blessed evening. Please get home by 10. Apparently, they lock us up afterwards. Good night.